Hello, and welcome to The Kosh. I'm your host, Timber Smith, and The Kosh is a podcast that spotlights people who've had an association with The Kosh or the surrounding Fox Cities area. Kosh listeners, how are we doing this morning? It is another wonderful day here in The Kosh, another wonderful weekend morning. And this episode of The Kosh is sponsored by Sturgeon Spirits Craft Distillery, The Kosh's newest tradition. Big, big shout out to my friends over there at Sturgeon Spirits. And um, yeah. All right. So, Kosh listeners, let me give it to you like this. I usually like to give you a little bit of a report. It is a nice July or January day here in Wisconsin. And what do I mean by that? Anything in the 30s is a happy space for me. As long as we're not in a polar vortex or squalor or any of those other words that seem to be created here in Wisconsin that no one knows, to me, that's a good winter day, particularly in January, because you don't know what you're going to get in January. And I trust February even a little less. Oh, you know what? We're in February. Ah, you know what? Now I thought, you know, we're we're a day off. We're a day off. Well, I trust February less than I trust January. So if we can make it through this February without many days with funny names, I am all about that life. Okay, so gosh, listeners, here's what's going on for this episode. I can't tell you how excited I am about this particular episode because of who we've got sitting in the chair today and all the cool things that we're going to be able to talk about, you know, over these hundred plus episodes of the Kosh, you know, we talk about the Kosh, we talk about things happening in the Kosh and, and people's associations with it. How do they fit it, fit into this community puzzle piece? But this time we've got a leader of the Kosh and um, somebody who's truly helping to make this place a better place. So I'm super, super excited. And, you know, you know what I'm really going to say. I don't know how I continue to get these amazing, amazing guests. And this week by far is no different. So without any further ado, this week's guest is Mark Roloff. Hey, Mark. Good morning. How are you, Timber? I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. It's Saturday morning. The weather's halfway decent, a little cloudy, but you know, yeah. it's, it'll be a nice day. I'm going to get out and enjoy the winter thaw, I guess it's it, what we call it, huh? Is that, uh, yeah, I guess it is kind of a winter thaw because the snow is slowly like disappearing quickly. You know, I don't, I don't think our ice fisher people are that happy about this whole deal. I think they're probably a little disappointed by what's happening. Yeah. The, uh, you know, outer, the, uh, what is it? The Bago. Battle on Bagos Battle this weekend. On, right. Otter Street Fisheries in a couple of weeks. That doesn't look very good either. So. Yeah, no, I don't think that's happening. And Polar Plunge is coming up. Yeah. Actually, I think that's next weekend. Yeah, that'll t- take the temperature up from 33 maybe to 34, but <laughs> <laughs> it'll still be cold. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to do the jump. Have you ever done it? No. I you know, I could sit here and tell you I've been dr- tried to drag to it, but I don't know if my heart could take it. Oh, it is fine. You've done it? I've done it. Yeah. And wait, if I can do it, Mark, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got the insulation. I just don't know. I just heard so many different stories and everything. It's like, I don't know if that's my thing. Uh, well, you know what? I knew it wasn't my thing, but I did it with the Veterans Resource Center for UWO. And actually, it was a last minute decision. I had said, no, 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 no. And then some other people had backed out of it. And, you know, my thing was this as a leader, as former military, when they call, you show up. They called, I showed up, I jumped with them. And uh, let me tell you, and here's the thing, I don't swim. So that's the only other thing that freaks me out just a little bit more. <laughs> and I totally lost my footing in there, got the shock of the ice cold water, like all of it. Like it was, it was something, but uh. they do an excellent, excellent job. Um, somebody was definitely in there to help guide me out because I was just like, oh my God, what is happening? And I must say that that hot tub time after you come out is awesome. <laughs> I imagine that's probably the best part of it all. <laughs> uh, well, there's a, well the, the best part of it all is actually after uh, you get out of those wet clothes and those and you find you a couple of libations to, to giggle about the whole fact that you were crazy enough to jump in it. 
but it is a fantastic fundraiser. Yeah, it is. It's a great cause, so you can't you can't uh, dispute that one. Yeah, well, I hope to see you there because I'm going to be emceeing it. Oh, now I see what's uh, is that what this whole thing is about? You, I, who knew where we were going with this? Oh yeah, I was setting you up. <laughs> Set me up. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I could give you choices, Mark. So like, you could jump in, or you could come MC with me. You know, and this could be a great opportunity. Oh man, well <laughs> the MCing part. See, I think if anybody was going to be doing that, they'd have to get just kind of goaded into it the last second. So I just feel you're luring me into this trap there. Oh, I'm just setting you up. I'm just setting you up. By the end of the episode, we're going to have you. We're going to have you. I think it'll be a fabulous opportunity. (laughs) Oh, man. All right. You ready to jump in? Yeah, let's go. Okay, Mark. Can you please tell us a little something about yourself and your connection to the Kosh? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, my... uh, Connection to the Kosh has, you know, been a evolutionary thing over the years. I actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and mm. and uh, I haven't lived in Cleveland in over forty years. You know, I went away to school and found city management as a career, and there aren't a lot of city management jobs uh, in the uh, northeast Wisconsin or northeast uh, Ohio area. So uh, I've uh, kind of made my way around. City managers are kind of like uh, basketball coaches; you kind of you're itinerant and you move around. So I've been in, uh, after grad school in Kansas, go Jayhawks, rock chalk. I, uh, mm. I was in Colorado, California for a good part of my career. Bruh. Uh, and then 32 years ago, uh, moved to Wisconsin. How I, I met a gal in California who was from Beaver Dam Bruh. and that's what, that's <laughs> what got us here. And I've been, I've worked for three different cities here in Wisconsin over the last 32 years. Been in kind of an orbit of Oshkosh the whole time. I was a city administrator in Berlin in the early to mid 90s. And then the town of Grand Chute, uh, a neighbor to your uh, your current employer, and for uh, 12 years, almost 12 years. And then I've been here in Oshkosh a little over 15 years now. Okay. So that kind of, that's how I got here, was, uh, was following the work. Hey, well, I think we get to, I think we get to say you're one of us. Yeah, well, I hope so. That, <laughs> no, that's not that, a hope. Uh, you, you're Kosh. You're yeah. stuck with it. Well, you know, I, I always said, you know, the hardest thing was talking my wife into moving to Oshkosh, and the hardest thing after that would be to move out of Oshkosh. Because, right. well, you know, we do. This is home. Uh, we raised our kids here, and, they, and, and they've and enjoyed being here. So that's uh, that means a lot. And, you know, when your family uh, is happy, then that makes things a lot easier. Oh, facts. <laughs> if they're miserable, uh, that's not going to go well. Yeah. So Grand Shoot, I think they're looking right now for a city administrator again. They just filled it a couple weeks ago. Did they? Yeah. So, uh, okay. yeah. So they've got that all squared away and everything. And, you know, there are a handful of people that are still there from when I was there. But, uh, and, yeah, you know, I've been in the, the business. So, you know, you know who your peers, contemporaries are there. So <clears throat> they have a new administrator. I've known him probably 20 years. So that's, uh, it's, I think they'll be well-served. Okay. That's awesome. If you weren't doing what you currently do professionally now, what would you want to be doing? Uh, so, you know, if, are you talking about, I uh, still a, a former city manager. No, thing? I'm just saying the, I was doing anything, anything, anything in the anything, world. Anything, anything, anything. Well, it's sort of a two pronged answer because, you know, if I wasn't doing this, I would certainly want to be, mentoring young people interested in public service. That's mm. really important to me. That's that's why I got into this. It was to to serve the public. And so finding people to take over, you know, positions everywhere because it's building that bench for for my profession. So, uh, you know, I've been I've been in city management for 40 years now, Timber. So, Whoa, it, is, it is it is part <laughs> it is part of who I am. So, I uh, thinking about the future trying to help young people who are interested in this, teaching them about it. Uh, so, so if you said, well, if you weren't doing that, I'd be a social studies teacher, you know, just talking about the same stuff, encouraging the same thing to, to get people to say public service is a, a noble calling and, uh, and I enjoy it and I love to tell people about it. So that'd kind of be it. But it's hard. It is hard. It but, is hard. But it's rewarding. Oh yeah, no doubt. And that's and I, I gotta say that on those days where it's where it's hard. 
is you have to say, but I'm doing this for a reason. And when you make, when you make a, when you have accomplishments and you see progress going forward, it's like, yeah, that's why I did this. That's why I'm doing this. So, and I've had several points in my career where it's like, maybe that's why I'm doing this. I I was meant to do this. And I thought, you know, when I hit 60, you know, a few years ago, it's like, well, you know, I've had several of these things and then COVID hit. And then I was like, maybe that's why I was here because part of my, part of my thing was keeping people calm. And now that, and we should talk about that a little bit. <laughs> like, just because I just think that was such a interesting blip on the radar. Like, like you couldn't plan for that. Oh, heavens no. I mean, we, we talk about emergency planning all the time, and we do some great things with emergency planning. But you can't plan. There, there were so many more social aspects to it. Right. You know, I, 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 I think I've told people, Give me a good public infrastructure project. That's easy. You build it and you finish it and you're done. And you can look at a new street and say, wow, you know, we Mm. built this new street. That was so complex. COVID and everything that went with it. It wasn't just, it wasn't even just health. You know, health was the core of it, but it was the social aspects. It just got everybody just all, you know, into a frenzy about different aspects of their life being impacted, whether it was having to go into a place of business with a mask or your kids. And, you know, and if you had kids, that was the, the toughest of all. And, uh, that was tough. I think, I think the surprise, a lot of it was COVID truly put a highlight on inequities. It just made those things pop out like wildfire, right? Where I don't want to say they're necessarily ignored, but sometimes you don't realize how much of a challenge is in those spaces until they're on fire. Then you're like, oh, this was kindling. (laughs) That turned into a full-blown fire. Everybody has different backstops in their life to help them. And the people who didn't, whose backstops weren't as secure, it pointed that it pointed out that your backstops weren't there, whether it was because of a job or because of somebody being able to watch your kids or whatever financial cushion you may have had. Yeah, everybody's backstop's different, and I think that's sort of what you're talking about with, with inequities, because my back, I had pretty good backstop. You know, I did okay. Not everybody can say that. Oh, no, there's a ton of people who didn't do okay. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's, the, it's, the, it's the slow effect of it coming out. It's, you know, I think we're still seeing some of those impacts and everything. I think we're still recovering. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to put it. Right. You know, and I, I I do think I do think what was probably good about it is at least they've there was a spotlight put on it and we said, we realized okay, we need to fix some of this stuff or we need to at least acknowledge that these things exist or we need to study this so we can create so if this doesn't happen again or or that these holes in the system don't exist. I think it did a lot of good stuff like that. Even though it's highly challenging, it did put pause and even just workplace stuff. The transformation of remote work. That's huge. Oh yeah. And even, you know, remote work and, you know, just virtual type of meetings. You know, I've found, oh, we can do that through a virtual meeting. We don't need to have everybody come from all over the place. You know, I got departments, you know geographically spread out. I, I got a bunch of people in city hall, but I got people geographically spread out. Sometimes just say, Hey, let's get on a zoom. Let's do this real quick. That's been great. But then other things, people, even with that technology, people have been left out, right? If they didn't have the technology as much, or they just were uncomfortable with it. I mean, not everybody's comfortable doing that stuff. Well, not, not comfortable. Uh, if you're talking about outside of work and you're dealing with people out in the community, some of them just, we, and, and, you know, in, in education, one of the mistakes that we have made is to assume everybody has this. So like everybody has internet. Guess what? Everybody doesn't have internet. Everybody has a computer. Guess what? Everybody doesn't have a computer. There's all these assumptions made because we, we are looking at, we're assuming from our lens and then we find out, oh no. But those things you kind of really needed to have in place during COVID. Oh, yeah. Because that was, that was totally the connection points. Yeah. I mean, I, I can remember there was, I had a, I had, I was working from home 
during one of these points. I was probably recovering from COVID or something. Had my laptop there. Something goofy happened. My laptop didn't work. And I'm getting ready to start a meeting. But I had the ability to say, oh, I got my phone. I picked it up, you know, loaded it in. And next thing you know, I'm on. And it was like, I had that ability. I had that flexibility. The backstops. I had lots of backstops. Right. And so for me, I had those abilities to do it. Not everybody has that. Right. I mean, they maybe have one backstop if they have anything. Yeah. It's like, this is all I got. This um, is all I got. If. 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 And you saw kids hanging outside of the school or hanging outside of our public library to get internet. You know, it's stuff oh, like yeah. that. I mean, they, they got the tablet for the tablet or whatever. Their the Chromebooks. Computer. Chromebooks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, you know, they got their Chromebooks, but they're literally sitting in front of uh, our public library to get to get Wi-Fi access. And it's like, right. wow. And until you see that, you do. You just take it for granted. It's like, oh, you know, here, you know, here, just get on and log on and you're good to go. But even still, and people lost the human connection and there's still a human connection. You know, we're sitting here in a room in your house. This wouldn't be the same if we were just on, on the, on phones in our own little living rooms and stuff like that. Absolutely. That personal connection is so important. And I hope we don't lose that because, uh, losing it, what, what little bit we lost, I, I didn't like losing that human connection. I still like to have, you know, face-to-face -face meetings and, uh, nuances and, and getting off topic and talking about, you know, you know, family stuff or, you know, what'd you do this weekend or, you know, the, the latest sport, the last sporting event you, you watched the night before stuff like that. I mean, you don't, and then you get to know the person, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And that's, you know, that's so much, that's so important in a working situation, you know, yeah, it's, it's business and everything, but if you don't have that personal connection with your fellow workers, it's, it just, uh, it's, it's not as fun. And it's in, when you're really problem solving, when you know a person's motivations, you know, their, their likes, their dislikes, you know, it's, it's knowing those things that really help you have a, a better working relationship, not just a personal relationship. I think it's a leadership thing. And, um, actually I, I just, an episode coming up in the future, I had a conversation with a, a leader, um, which I'm not going to expose at this time, but I'm super excited when we do release this episode because we really went outside the box on this episode. But that getting to know those people, that's a leadership quality. Like you need to know your team. You've oh. got to know your team and you need to know more than just the work parts of your team to be able to truly have the most effective and productive an impactful team that you can have. Oh, absolutely. Just knowing little things about them when you need to problem solve and you know that this person has a certain skill or maybe even a weakness, you know, you know that and it's, you can make weaknesses advantages for your team. It's like, if this person isn't super good at that, well, then you don't want to put them right in front of it, but you want to still expose them just a little bit so that maybe they can improve on that weakness through watching others succeed in that same area. And it's just that it's that combination. It's planning for the future, even when they're not ready for it. Facts. Yeah. Facts. Okay. I got some questions. I want to ask Let's you. roll. Let's roll. All right. Before we jump in the segments. All right. What do you think? some of the biggest myths are about being a city manager. <clears throat> well, it's funny. I'll, one of the biggest lies that are ever, it's ever told to me is, is the misunderstanding that, that I'm an elected official that because I work for the government, I must be elected. So the biggest lie I've heard over my career is somebody will lean into me and just kind of whisper in my ear. I voted for you. <laughs> <Bruh>. <laughs> and i'm just like and what do you do i mean they're they're being nice but you just know they just told you a lie so i just go oh i just pat him on the shoulder thank you very much and i was like oh my gosh it was like it's okay just let it let it go let it go but yeah i can't tell you timber the number of times i've been told that so the myth or the misunderstanding really i myth, the <laughs> misunderstanding that it's i'm an elected official and, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm very committed as a public servant and I believe in uh, a city manager position. It is not for every community, not for everybody. I think it's worked well in Oshkosh because when 
politics get a little crazy. My job is to make sure that in spite of all the politics, that the work of the city continues to get done. And listening to the elected officials, listening to the community, listening to our employees, developing a plan of action and moving forward with it and uh, you know, helping create a vision, helping seven different people reach consensus on a direction they want the community to go and then getting that done is I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. So it's understanding what my role is, but you know, people say, well, they're there, but what about mayors? And it's like, well, our community, our mayor is simply just the, the leader of the legislative body. And I work closely with the mayor on planning for our council meetings in terms of how do we move things forward? But it's really no different than the school district. Nobody ever talks about, well, yeah, we ought to elect our superintendent. The superintendent has an incredible skill set that is based on years of of work and understanding of the of the education system. I'm just a specialist in local government. So I think I offer a great value to the community. That doesn't mean that I'm doing everything you necessarily agree with, but my goal is to carry out the policies that the council sets, help set a vision, get them to confirm that vision, and then move forward on those things. And also part of my role is to, and, and I've told council this, and I, I, this is more for me, my personal accomplishment as a city manager. I will carry out a policy so well that even if I disagree with it, I will carry it out so much that people will think it was my own idea because I, I feel so strongly about carrying out council's policies regardless of where my opinion is. Uh, that's my job. I will help suggest visions and suggest ideas. And if they don't go along with them, they say, well, we kind of want to do this instead of that. That's, that's fine. And I carry that out so that the council doesn't have any doubts that I am fulfilling their vision. And I owe it to them to, to make sure that they don't have doubts that I'm going to carry out what they want. Okay. Well, you kind of went into this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think maybe we can flush this out just a bit more. So more of the differences between a city manager and a mayor, right? I work for a mayor. Yeah. And I'm talking to a city manager. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every community is different in terms of how they want to be governed. The council manager form is the most common form of local government in the United States for cities over 25,000 people. So it is more common, but I think a lot of people don't know about it or understand it. I mean, they're just used to hearing about mayors and things like that. But every community is different. Wisconsin is a, is a, is a little more different than I would say the rest of the country. Our laws that have created city manager positions, you've probably heard of city administrators too. And yeah, city administrators. I, I, could, I could geek you out with a podcast just on that, but the law that created the city manager position is over 100 years old, and it probably should have been updated about 90 years ago. So be, <laughs> because of that, it puts a lot of things in place that you're allowed to change. But if you read the statute or read the statute on its face, it's like, well, this really doesn't make sense. And for modern days, it doesn't. There was, for example, I mean, you've been on bo our boards and commissions and stuff like that. The statute says that I should be on the plan commission. Well, the statute also allows us to undo that. And about 50 years ago, the city manager, new city manager came on board and said, why am I on the plan commission? That's wrong. <clears throat> That's a policymaking body. The city manager does not belong in a policymaking body. Correct. So he was wise enough to get that off of our books and it allowed it. But if you read the statutes, it's like this person has way too much power. And, but a hundred years ago, that was part of the reform movement. So city managers were part of a reform movement to get away from patronage jobs and things like that. Hiring was based on merit and the ability to do a job. So it hasn't kept up the, the Wisconsin statutes haven't kept up, but elsewhere in the country, you know, for example, the state of California, largest state in the country, they have roughly 400 cities. All but three of them are managed by a city manager. All of them. The only three that aren't are the, are the three of the biggest, 
LA, San Francisco, San Diego. That's what I was going to guess. That's it. Right. That's it. And San Diego, it's only been about 15 years. They, they did away with it. They wanted more political leadership and, and certainly, and that's the argument in favor of a mayor. And I was having a discussion. I was just with, I'm on the League of Wisconsin Municipalities uh, board. No. You know, and we had a, you know, our board meeting the other day and we're sitting there the night before the meeting and we're, we're in the lounge having a couple of drinks and it, and we were talking about this very issue and it's like, you know, what's, what's the role of the mayor? What's the role of the manager? And it's, as long as they are working together towards the same goals, you know, it can work out. If you don't have a good working relationship, like anything, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, managing a city, running a, a, a big city or you're flipping burgers. Correct. If you don't work together, you're not going to accomplish things. And so part of the role of, of mine is to make sure that I work closely with whoever the public elects. I don't pick my bosses, nor should I. So part of it is, is making sure that you respect the will of the people. And that's part of a city manager's code of ethics. The council is elected by the people. They reflect the people and your job is to carry out their policies. So now some people think it should be more political. Some people think it should be uh, the, the chief executive should be accountable to the people. I'm accountable to the people through the elected officials. But, you know, in, especially in our world today, there is so much divisiveness. But even with different political views, if we can get our local elected officials working towards common goals that we all want, we all want clean water, we all want good streets, we all want to be safe, Let's agree on those things, and then we can set aside the politics. And, you know, there little political philosophies do come out, but for the most part, when we're solving problems that are of a local nature, council members come together a lot better. And my goal is to get that consensus with everybody and just get some direction and then carry it out, regardless of what that final outcome is. And sometimes the politics go back and forth, but even though the politics go back and forth from some way, we're still moving forward, uh, achieving goals and everything. So I think that's the value that the city manager position provides so that even with a change in the political philosophy, we're still working towards making our community better. What's one of the biggest lessons you've learned in the position, particularly related to the cash? Yeah. Boy, that's a great question. I think the thing is that there will be changes in views, but there is still some fundamental agreements. And the, the best example I can give you, Timber, is I was hired in 2008 and literally. Bruh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a minute. That's it. Yeah. That is that. And. I got hired and then I was like, I hope this isn't God's message to Oshkosh that this was not a good decision because that was June of 2008 when we had those incredible floods. Oh, and I remember those. five days later, I'm at the state conference for city managers and we're at, we're at a, a cocktail party that night. And we're actually, we were brought down to the basement of this bar that we were at because there was a tornado warning in the vicinity and somebody said, Mark, look up at the TV, your new city is underwater. And they had, and we were terrible. So when I got here, I had a great discussion with uh, Stu Rickman, who at that time was the managing editor of the Northwestern and the Northwestern was a very influential, totally different. I mean, media is just totally different. The Northwestern was a substantial influencer in this. It was community. a staple. It, it really was. And Stu said, Mark, you got the easiest job in the world. And I was like, these, we just went through these floods and this, and everybody is just on a, is a bummed out. How can you say this is easy? And he looked at me and said, you've got consensus that we need to fix this stuff. It's easy. Go fix it. And he was just very direct with me, but it, but it was like, okay. And it, I think he was trying to encourage me that it was achievable because of that. And, and I hit the gas when yeah. it came to, we have to address flooding problems in our community. I remember that. And I remember all like, of a sudden, 
all of this infrastructure stuff started happening. It was just like a light switch went on. And the funny thing was, was that when I got here, I looked at the books and our stormwater utility and people complain about stormwater rates. They have every right to complain about them. But I looked, we had $10 million in cash in the bank doing absolutely nothing because we were spinning our wheels about arguing about which project to start first. And there was this controversy over each and every project that it would be, we get to the cusp of getting it approved and then get pushed back. So I was like, I'm not going to let that happen. So I, I tried to push forward one and it was one that had been tried just before I got here. And somebody famously told the council, there's no flooding problem in our area. And that was in May of 2008. <laughs> and then the next month, those people, I'm sure they ate their words because the flood, their, their basement was flooded. And I have, I take no satisfaction out of people being wrong about that thing. They underestimated. And so my job was, you know, what did I learn? It was that rallying people around a cause that they all agree on what they wanted to accomplish. How is a little different. So I brought this project forward. It got rejected again. And somebody said, well, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm never bringing that project back. And I said, but we're going to get projects done. And I got one that was less controversial. We, and it was the first major project. It was, it was outside the city. So I didn't have as much local fighting about it. We bought a big parcel out there on James road, about four miles outside of town. And we, we built that first 55 acre pond. And then I was talking to some people that are down just North of West high school. And they said, I notice that it's, it's not flooding. The river, the Creek isn't flooding as much. And it's like, we got progress. And then I had somebody else. We fixed the neighborhood near, not too far from here, just a little North of, of downtown. And they said, you know, my sump pump doesn't run as much Mark. Mm -hmm. And it was just little things like that. So once I knew I was building confidence in our work, then everything would, would come after that because once the confidence started building, so there was a lack of confidence that we could get things done. And, and I just, is that always, what it is? I got to ask, is that what it always was? Because I'm not going to lie. My, my view was always like, we hate change. <laughs> change comes hard here. It, yeah. Well, yes, but I'm putting a little corollary on that and saying it was confidence that we could do it confidence that we can't do this well of course we can another thing when i got here i heard a lot of feedback about city employees being negative and that hurts that personally hurts now i didn't have any ownership in that at the time i was the new guy mm -hmm. <clears throat> so i didn't own anything right but the i've seen it over my career that people if you don't get exactly what you wanted from your local government they aren't listening and it's like, well, we have certain rules and procedures and we have to be, we have to be equitable and we also have to make sure that we're doing it efficiently and effectively and we can't, you know, you're not supposed to show favoritism. So it's like, I have to treat you the same. And so if I say yes to you, why am I not saying yes to the next person? So part of it is to play safe. We say no consistently. And so saying no means there's a limit to what we can do. But I remember people just saying negative things. And um, at the time, my office was on the first floor. Uh, and you're familiar enough with City Hall. But And the men's room is on the total end of the building. So when I had to go to the restroom, I had to walk the entire length of the building. And I went by, by three or four different customer service places. And in our clerk's office was our deputy clerk. And she issued liquor licenses and stuff like that. And... She was so friendly and people are like, well, thank you so much. This is great. Thank you. It's like, how can people be saying negative things? It's like, so I started to point those out and it's like, I heard this the other day. I was walking through city hall and I heard this and I said, you guys do great work. And I, and, and so I, and I'd praise the individual and I'd call that person out and say, you know, I'm going to say the person's name now because she passed away, Angie. She did the, she did a great job. And it's like, there are a lot more people like Angie than there aren't. And I said, we need to tell our story better. And 
And there were, at that time, there were, there was negative feelings about our inspections office. And it's like, I had to make some changes over there. So I plucked my fire chief who I, I had great respect for Tim Franz, our former fire chief. And I said, I need you to temporarily run inspections while I, until I find a new person. And his end of his first day, he came to my office and said, do you know what? When somebody, when we issue a, an inspections complaint, you know, but with a neighbor, do you know, we get compliance 90% of the time on the first ask. And it was like, and you'd think that we were just being vicious. It's like 90% of the time we get, we send out a letter saying, Hey, we notice this code says this. Would you, would you please clean it up? 90% of the time done. First time never ask again. And it was, and we'd get complaints. Oh, their city's being so overbearing and just, you know, just being mean about it. It's like, well, 90% of the people just go, Oh, I didn't realize that and took care of it. So I realized that we had a lot of people that were okay with what we were doing and we needed to tell more of those stories. So it's talking about the positive experience we were having and then why, why do we have to say no sometimes and trying to explain that. So I think it helped improve things. I still get complaints about things, but it's usually that 10% that you have to, you have to ask them two, three, four times to fix something. But 90% of the people say, cool, thanks for letting me know. And, you know, if you had a piece of spinach on your tooth, are you going to fight with me if I say, hey, Timber, you got a piece of spinach on your tooth? You're going to say, oh, thanks for telling me. I didn't want my, I didn't want to hang it from my tooth. And it's like, they don't even think anything of it until you point it out. And so us just being a good neighbor, just saying, hey, there's this little problem. And people say, thanks. Thanks for letting me know. Changing that outlook was super important. And I think we did it. And we still get complaints. And there's still people thinking we're well. You're always going to get complaints. Yeah, that's just normal. Oh. And you know, and and because you work over in the city of Appleton, I hear plenty of times. Well, Appleton doesn't do that. And I call up Appleton. Well, yeah, we do. You know, people say you guys are, you know, you guys are too easy in Oshkosh, and we're the overbearing ones. It's just part of part of business, and we we trade notes with our our friends and our other communities all the time, and hear stories about oh, well, they don't do that here. It's like, well, yeah, we do the same thing. And so 90% of the people fix things on the first time. That was so powerful to me that most people are just chill about it. They'll fix, they'll fix something and without any hesitation. So no culture shifting, or did you have to do some culture shifting? Because that's the one thing that I think I see. And I, and I do agree with you. The loudest voices make things sound larger than what they are sometimes. But there is a culture thing too. Like uh, one of the things I want to say uh, is, you know, I find that that interaction, well, the interaction with our, with our public, uh, with the, with our community members is like, it's the most important thing you can do. Right. Because that's the whole point of public service. It's literally called public service for a reason. Right. Yeah. And where I find the best outcomes come because it's, you know, it's an intelligent, uh, our residents are intelligent. Uh, the people that live in our communities, they know what's up. Where the breakdown to me tends to happen is when we in public service don't listen to them. Like they may know that it's not right. And they may know this, this is going to have to change, but they want the ability to feel heard. And that's where I find good outcomes come. Because once they well, uh, often once they feel heard, they're like, "Got it, good. I I understand. It makes sense. Yeah, it's not what I want, but it makes sense. And okay, a lot of times it is just about being heard. You know, I can't take every complaint. If I did, I wouldn't get my job done. But you know, I have to every once in a while. And I I say, if for nothing else, for quality control purposes. But sometimes you just know in your gut, I got to take this one. I got to take this one. And it is, it's just like they've, they've complained. It's still the same answer that the first caller, the first person who took the call, but it was like, and you're explaining it. Part of it is, you know, yeah, they hear it from the top. They hear the consistent message. And so that consistent message is super important. Is that culture change? I'd say, yeah, because I think too often we had 
we had too many silos and we didn't talk to each other. And, you know, one of our first strategic planning sessions we did with our supervisors were, you know, some of the code enforcement people realized that the police were dealing with some of the same people. And once they realized they were dealing with the same, you know, Mary Jones, it's like, oh, you deal with her too? Well, yeah. Then they realized, oh, number one, you know, we see a lot of people in common. What works for you? Well, this works for me when I talk to her. That works. And then that consistent message when, and when Mary Jones calls us and we get the consistent message, when it gets to me then, if I'm saying the same thing, it's like, all right, word, that's it. It's, it's, I'm not getting a different message. So this is the way it's going to be. And I got hurt. And it's like, well, I want you to know that I'm not concerned about it. And then everyone, then at the end, somebody's like, can you fix a pothole over on, on high Avenue? <laughs> and that's like, Hey, let me look into that. It's, it wasn't what they called about, but the fact that they're like, I got to talk to city manager and it's like, that's cool. But they, yeah, I think they do. They want to be heard and I can't talk to ever all 66,000 people, but if I can make an impression and help try to maybe make them an ambassador for us, because we all, we're all ambassadors. Well, that, do, we want, do we want to be, and it doesn't matter if you're a city employee or not. I, I tell all my employees, I, you guys are all ambassadors. Oh, I need you. Well, yeah. This is something I hear from my boss all the time is like uh, an individual, you know, whatever that, however that interaction goes, they're going to tell that story 20 plus times. So it matters, right? Because there's an echo effect to it. And they're going to tell it, and you don't know when they're going to tell it, because they could tell it a bunch of times in the first month, but they're going to tell it 10 years from now, too, and because it's never going to leave, right? And so it's very important in how you approach that. What I would also ask is um, then, like a big portion of what I do is community engagement, going out here and actually listening and doing this part. Do we have any community engagement people within the, the Kosh team? who that's kind of what they do. No, I, not many that are specifically intended for that. We have some communi communications and marketing people in some of the departments. And I would say, you know, even police and fire, but that's more about communicating things out in terms of listening. It really, be, you know, for staffing purposes, it really becomes part of everybody's job. It would, it'd be nice to do more of that, but when we're challenged for different services and everything for me to say, I need somebody out there listening kind of looks like it's a luxury. And so that's part of my job is to listen, but I can't, like I said, I can't, I can't hear all 67,000 people. And I would even argue that even one person wouldn't be enough. I need every city employee to listen. I have relationships with people out in the community. You know, I need their ears and everything. We're doing strategic planning cycle. We're just starting it. We're having a, um, a focus group. So I got suggestions from people and reached out a handful of people. I don't even know, but it's like they're, they're getting together a little group of about 20 of them next week, just so we can hear what's on their mind because that elements list is, is missing. So don't have a dedicated person, but we're trying to do better to, to find different vehicles to do that listening for us. Okay. And my last question, at least concerning this, because here's the funny thing. We've, we've covered a lot of amazing stuff and demystified some things, I think. And I think this is going to be wonderful for the Kosh listeners. And we haven't even jumped into the episode yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, when am I coming back, Timber? <laughs> uh, one last one. Yeah. What excites you the most? about the future of the cash. We really are geographically in an incredible place and taking advantage of what we have and what the new chapters of it, you know, the riverfront was dominated by industry for years. And now that we're, we got to clean it up because all those sins of the past, and I'm not going to condemn anybody. That's just the way it was. Theta Care is going to be uh, Theta Care and Freighter merging together. They're going to be building a micro hospital. Great addition to the downtown. Great addition to the riverfront. Taking advantage of that, you know, we were talking at the at the beginning, you know, just about the uh, 
Battle on Bago and just those types of things. A lot of people outside the area don't even know much about us. So I think touting our natural resources and how family friendly that is, this is a great place to raise a family. That's why people like you and I have stayed. We chose to come to Oshkosh. You know, if you were born here, you were born here, and this is pretty much all you know. I love people who have been born and raised in Oshkosh, went away, chose to come back. They're kind of oh, like you boom, and me. We call them boomerangs. Yeah, they're boomerangs. But we chose. We we're not we're not boomerangs. We no. chose to come to Oshkosh. Chose, chose to stay here. Chose to stay. Most important, chose to stay. And I think what we have to offer in that combination of community, the right size, you can get involved in the community, you can enjoy the community, and if you want some big city amenities, or you can go, yeah, yeah, you can go. You have an NFL game. You can go to an NFL game. You go to a major sporting, natural resources. We're really in a great location, and we have to make this as family-friendly as possible. And it goes beyond the city because I can't do all these things. The city can't do all these things. Our schools, that's, you know, we don't, a lot of people think we have something to do with the schools. Mm. No, they're just, a, they're an independent group of people that we have to work with, though. Making our schools. So, you know, I listen very intently when the school district talks about their vision because their vision is a huge component of our success. So facts working together and, you know, breaking down these silos or just not even recognizing them as silos. This is a, this is a mosaic we're painting and we've got a responsibility to, to work with each other to make that stuff happen. Still, we got to, we can't be so down on ourselves. We are a better community than we think we are. And it's, it's, yes, happy. we don't celebrate ourselves enough. No. I do, I do think that 100%. And, you know, the council has said that to me. It's like, you know, we need to tell our story more, Mark. We, and, you know, I, I would, I, and people have told me this, you know, you, you can't be so modest. You can't be so modest. And it's like, but I don't like to sit there and brag. But, but as a community, we got a heck of a lot to brag about. And so it's like, okay, this isn't about me, the individual. This is about us as a community. So bragging about ourselves and what we have and, you know, and that's, what's cool about, you know, listening to, you know, different podcasts. It's like, where'd that person come from? They've been here. They've been here. Facts. It's like, let's listen to these people. They got some great ideas yeah. and bringing everybody <laughs> together is and giving everybody the confidence that we can, we can be a better community with the people we have here right now. So there's my optimism about the future. Well, I'm big on you do got to tell it because if you don't tell it, someone else is going to tell it their way. So you got to control the narrative. You got that. So I'm big on that one. All right. We're ready to jump in now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Mark, thank you. Thank you for let's go for going through these questions. I just know our Kosh listeners are going to really appreciate this authenticity, this level of of detail, this level of conversation because this isn't something you always get. Yeah, right. So, it's, and uh, you know, I love the fact that you are sitting here chilling it's in just, the studio. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. All right. Well, we're going to jump into the first segment, and the first segment is called What in the World is Going On With? And that's where you start with the phrase, what in the world, and then you tell us what is on your mind. So, Mark, what do you got? Well, it's probably going to be a little city-related, but it's not something I deal with all the time. What's the world, what in the world is going on with people misunderstanding elections? Bruh. Throughout our country, we have municipal clerks who are just dedicated, super dedicated to having fair safe elections facts and and that's they they are some of the most dedicated public servants you will ever see and those poor souls are working on rules that change literally at the last minute there are for example there's a rule that they have to have the ballots printed by a certain number of days before the election yet 2 days before that deadline now imagine, I mean, if you're, if I, if I make you responsible for printing something and I say, I want it done on Friday and it's Monday, you probably had that print order in a 
couple weeks before that. You right. didn't just wait until Monday to do it. And then on Monday, you come in, you you put the order in. Uh, we might be changing the ballots because the courts are going to be making a decision. Mm. And it's like, and then it's like, well, we don't have the ballots. There's got to be a conspiracy. What are you doing wrong? It's like, are you kidding me? I ordered the ballots three weeks ago, but they said, hold the presses. So literally we're holding the presses and that's just one example, but the rule changing that goes on between the different parties. And I'm not going to blame any party. That's I'm, I'm not here to do that. That I, I won't ever do that. I've seen it change so many times and municipal clerks, all they want to do is get these ballots out so people can vote <laughs> right? and get them back. Get, That's all they want to do. Right. Get ballots out, get volunteers to work the different polling places. That's uh, at least that's what I've observed. Yeah. And that's all. And you've got this, this group of people who are incredibly dedicated, but throughout the country. And I, you know, I say throughout the country, but I can tell you on a personal level, I know a lot of municipal clerks and, and I, I'm friends with one woman who is probably you know, the Dean of municipal clerks in Wisconsin. And she's like, I don't know who wants my job because it's the, she gets accused of doing things. It's like, where did you come up with this? And it's like, well, I want this ballot done this way and that way. It's like, I have to follow what the rules state. And when they change the rules and I got to hold the presses and then reprint number one, I'm wasting money as a taxpayer. You know, you should be outraged that we have to waste money because we have to change it. But if, like I said, if I gave you the responsibility to have these things printed by Friday, if you're doing your job, you did it, you know, two, three weeks ago. And it's like, no, we're going to change it on Monday. And now you got to call the printer up. I'd say printers throughout the country know this truth as well, because they're like, why are you changing your print order? You know, it's like, right. I've, I've moved everything to get this. And, and I, I praise the printers as well, because we have to ask them to change things. So the whole conspiracy theory thing just bothers me. Now, are there different rules that you and I might disagree with on how to administer elections? Yeah, we, we might disagree on stuff, but let's just make a decision and move on and run the election. And I may not get everything I want. Access to voting is a is probably the biggest philosophical debate. And it's like, I understand that people may disagree, but a municipal clerk's job is just, just to print the ballots and execute and, and execute. And they do an outstanding job. Just give them the rule book. Let them follow it and they'll get it done. And they are, and they're so, their integrity is incredible and people don't realize it. I've heard stories about municipal clerks that have done things wrong. Those are so rare. The people I've worked with as municipal clerks, my 40 years timber have been some of the most ethical people that I've ever worked with. They know the sanctity of their job. And, Absolutely. And they are just, and so it's like the rules and the people who are making the rules are part of the problem. And it's like, just make, give me the rule book. I'll follow it. My, our clerks will follow that rule book to the T, but then just don't say, well, you're breaking the law. It's like, no, there's very little discretion that the clerks have left. But even that, you know, it's like, let them exercise discretion. I can tell you I had a municipal clerk and I had a ballot worker, a poll worker. Her husband died between the time he absentee voted and the time of the election. This poll worker had to acknowledge that her deceased husband's vote could not count. She went to the clerk and said, you need to remove that ballot. That's integrity, Timber. Mm. And that happens, Heck, yeah, that that happens everywhere. I heard a similar story to that. That story was right here in Oshkosh. And that person knew, I know the rules and I know this vote can't count because on election day, her husband wasn't alive. Mm. You know, I salute those people. Facts. Just big facts. So I'm, what's yours? All right. <laughs> My what in the world is going on with is what in the world is going on with people in Selling things on Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace. Oh, and let me tell you, Bruh. I got a serious, uh, 
My thing is this. Look, if you know you want to buy it, then just buy it. Just let's make this arrangement. Let's make this happen. Let's not play the a 42 questions game, right? Because I'm trying to put everything in the description as is. And then you keep pushing out when you're going to pick up. Like you don't show up and then you're like, I was busy and then I'm going to come pick it up later on today. And then you don't show up and then, you know, like this stuff drives me and uh, the wife crazy. And, I, and and here's my thing. I love to sell stuff on Marketplace. I consider it recycling money because if it's sitting in my house and I'm not utilizing it, I might as well get some get what I can from it. Right. Let's recoup those funds and put those back into the circulation of the t- the Timber Smith household. <laughs> I am all about that. But then, you know, I can't stand when people just don't do a good deal. Let's just get it done. So what 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 spurred this? What in the world is going on with is I'm selling a pack of labels. Labels. Labels for a label machine, one of those that prints themselves a dynamo, right? Yeah. Found this pack of labels in my basement. Was like, oh, okay, you know, look, this is unopened. It's brand new. It's been sitting in the basement for a long time. You know what? I, I should just put it out here. I might get five, ten dollars for it. I'm gonna put it out here, right? I put it out there. I get hits. Okay, I was excited. I was like, okay, wasn't sure if people were really gonna want to buy it, but people did want to buy it. So I'm going through this, and this person refuses to just follow through. Like they've emailed us or messaged us like 10 times. And it's like, oh, I really want them. How many labels are there? Well, this is how many labels there are. Here's the picture. You can see it from the picture. That's how many labels are in there. Oh, what about this? Oh, what about that? They're labels. They're labels. And then they're like, okay, I'll take them. Then it's like, okay, I'll show up at 1.30. Didn't show up. Oh, well, I got caught up in a meeting at 10.30. Didn't show up. Well, are you free tomorrow? Maybe. Not sure. Well, you know what? This is becoming difficult because of your schedule. Wait a minute now. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Bruh. How did this become about my schedule? You're the one that didn't show up. Right? So, that, that, that you know, look, Facebook Marketplace. Now, once again, I'm not going to badmouth this particular vehicle of sales. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. It's like... The ability to digital rummage sale, right? I can put this out there. It doesn't have to be the biggest item. There's not a cost associated with it. Let's make this happen. And it's kind of like keeping a greener community because, you know, instead of just getting tossed into the landfill, this goes to another person that can actually utilize it. But people, quit playing these games. Just come on and buy it. If you want to buy it, let's buy it. That's where I'm at with it. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. That's probably why I don't do a lot of it. I, I Part of me just says, just give it to somebody who's <laughs> You're not some labels take of the, the recycling money, the recycling, the whole, the whole aspect of, you know, reusing stuff that can't get used. It's like, I don't know why you bought it in the first place, but I've got, my basement is full of things like that too. So I'm not judging anybody, but it's like, part of me is like, Hey, Timber, you want, you want this? I got it. You can take, if you can come by and get it, it's yours, man. Well, Mark, let me know when you have your rummage sale. <laughs> <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> Okay, let's jump into the next segment. Next segment is called 21 Questions. Not 21 questions, but might invoke 21 answers because these are really good in-depth questions. So, you ready to jump in? Let's roll. All right. What are you grateful for? I am extremely grateful for a kid who was the parents of a, a machinist and a waitress, became a city manager. Very grateful. Mm. Wouldn't have guessed it. Working class neighborhood, working class family. Got a master's degree, became a city manager. I'm incredibly grateful. What motivates you? Well, we've talked professionally. I think I've answered, kind of answered those things. You know, professionally is knowing that you're doing good for your community. On a personal level, just uh, raising a good family, being a good father, husband, friend just just you know somebody you can talk to rely on give you a straight answer tell you when you think you're not doing so well and then praising you when you are just being a good loyal friend what grounds you family and comes from two different places my family my wife my kids and then my sisters 
I had six sisters. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Three of them are gone now. Oh. Yeah. But they knew me from when I was a little kid. They know everything about me. They know what makes me tick. And it doesn't matter that I'm the city manager. I'm their stupid little brother. <laughs> <laughs> and they can ground me quicker than anything. Humble me and make me realize, okay, don't get, don't get so full of yourself, Mark. They're very good at that. You'd love them. Oh, most definitely. And uh, sisters are about that life. <laughs> they do it better than anyone. <laughs> well, you know, I, I always say, you know, sisters can fight like crazy. And my sister will be, yep, we fought like crazy. That probably made me a good city manager. Because when I've got people who disagree, whether it's residents or council, you know, my sister would be, I'd be sitting on, you know, watching TV and my sister would get into a fight. I'd take a deep breath, get out of the chair, go over, break up the fight. And, you know, and that's just what, what part of what I did. Well, I'm kind of still doing that today, Timber, after all these years. So they ground me and I grounded them. So it was kind of a, a two-way street. I like that. What does success look like? You know, this is going to sound corny, but this is a, this is what I did for fun in my twenties when I didn't, uh, I just moved to California. Didn't know anybody. I got a real estate license. I thought it'd be something, something interesting to do. And this person talked about success and they said, success is constantly moving towards completing worthwhile goals. So I think about that a lot is, uh, so I don't have a, you know, it's like, what does it mean to me? And I, I but I've reflected on that statement all the time. Am I, moving towards making progress towards worthwhile goals. And I'd say, yeah, I, I regularly do that. And even when I get employees that are talking about, you know, retiring, and, and somebody taught me this line many years ago, it's like, you know, run through the tape, just don't go through the motions, keep working towards completing worthwhile goals. And that is, that is important. So to me, that is constantly working on that. And that can apply to, on the personal level, what you want to do. If you want to lose a few pounds, well, you know, you're not, you might eat a donut uh, in the morning or something, but it's like, well, what are you going to do? Make up for that. So you keep working towards it. Well, maybe I have to take a, a longer walk or do this or that, take the stairs instead of the elevator, but constantly working towards worthwhile goals is part of my definition of success. What irritates you? What frustrates me is, you know, spinning wheels, talking about stuff and not getting it done. And that is something that, that drives me crazy. And I think over the course of my, my life, that's built into me. If it is to, if we talk about doing something, there's probably a grainy old photo from 1966, Timber, kindergarten. Uh, we had a play. And our teacher told us exactly what to do. And I'm on the stage and people aren't doing what the teacher, what we all agreed to do. And so the grainy photo shows me basically getting out of my character, getting people back into the right spots and moving on with the play. And it's just like, I was born to do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I just, and I, I see something that just is like, we agreed we were going to do this. Why aren't we doing it the way we planned it? And I've been doing that since I was six years old, Timber. Oh, <laughs> bro. <laughs> <laughs> what scares you? People with ill intent influencing people who have good intents. Or, that scares me because uh, we can get, you know, there are people who can do a great deal to help positively influence you. But if you get, you let somebody with ill intent lead you, not good's going to come of it because then good people are working towards bad intents, whether they do it knowingly or unknowingly. That, that scares me. What recharges your soul? I'd say the recharge is going home and your family doesn't care how bad of a day at work you had. That recharges you. You know, like when the kids were little, can you, you know, help me? I want to play this game. You want to play this game with me? Go outside and throw a ball. You know, even just will you sit and watch this TV show with me? Well, you know, for the most part, after a long day, 
I don't have any interest in watching. We were joking the other day about TV shows the kids used to watch and trying to remember the names of them. And I can't remember half the names. That was part of the joke. And it was like, but <laughs> part of our job was to just go. You know, so there was a, a show about a dog and it was on PBS. We figured it was wishbone. We had one of our kids do the answer. So we're texting all the kids. What was that show on PBS about the dog? Wishbone. Well, if I get home and wishbones, hey, dad, will you watch wishbone with me? You know, it, you know, I really want to just go take a nap, but you know, but you go and do it. And it's like, yeah, the problems of the world, my kids don't care about the kids. My kids just want to enjoy the day, play, do this and that, that grounds you every day. Now, now the kids are older. It's uh, what else grounds you? Well, sometimes just going home and taking a nap. I get to take the nap that I didn't get to take when the kids were little. Ooh, let me tell you, bro. I am a kind of sewer of naps. <laughs> yeah. love naps i don't need love them i don't need the two-hour nap I, I i can't understand that but just give me 10 minutes and i'm and i'm ready to roll and look hey mark don't talk bad about that two-hour nap that's a good nap <laughs> ah. that is a fantastic nap i look i don't discriminate short naps long naps 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 are yeah that's <laughs> it well now they talk about this you know they talk about lebron has you know he has to take a nap and it's like well if that's what made him so successful why the heck did i nap a lot sooner than that <laughs> right well we're just like you know what the sad part is is that we don't understand or appreciate naps until we're older that's how i feel about it like when I'm young, I'm thinking, I can't take a nap. It's too much to see and do. But if I took some naps when I was younger, it might might be a little different right now. Oh, yeah. So, Absolutely. Here's our tough question. How do you define love? Wow. that's It's more than just the relationship you have with uh, you know, the person that you uh, marry or have a long-term relationship with. Love is a lot more than that. It's mutual caring about another person, not not even the intimate stuff. I mean, sometimes the intimacy with a person you love is really just having an honest conversation. So it's it's being able to care for that person about their needs and and wanting to help them. That's that's the core of it. Because I can say, then I can say I can love anybody. It's not just the, the relationship you have with your spouse or something like that. Facts. What is your most memorable life lesson you learned from parent, guardian, mentor? Everybody's important. And just showing that care. And sometimes it's just by listening, like you were saying. Sometimes it's by doing. Sometimes you got to let them make their own mistakes. You cannot direct somebody's life. So, uh, but being there when they fall to show them you care and, uh, you know, yeah, you might have to teach a life, a life lesson and say, you know, but you can't necessarily say, I told you so, but you're there for them. Even when you disagreed with what they were doing, that goes back to the love part too. All right. You have survived 21 questions. All right. Okay. Next segment is called Word Association. This is where we say a word and you tell us what's on your mind. All right. So we have a tradition here on the cash and we start off with the same word every time. It is the word that unites us all. It is the word that when you say it, it makes you smile. It is the word of happiness and family. It is food. Food. I love Mexican food. Uh, oh, facts. facts. Uh, well, you know, the funny thing is, you know, this, this we, we can talk about Oshkosh and economic development now because I came to Wisconsin from California. So that's where I really learned my love of Mexican food. I mean, I just, in Cleveland, Ohio, growing up in the, you know, 60s and 70s, that Mexican food didn't exist. <laughs> so I got out to California. It was like, wow, I really enjoy Mexican food. Came to Wisconsin and Honestly, the only decent Mexican restaurant in 1992 was Tortilla Flats. And yeah, Lord, uh, yeah. that was it. That was it. There was some place I went to out by Green Lake and, oh, it's Mexican night. Oh, let's go. My wife and I both go out there. It was like barbecue sauce on a tortilla. 
And now things have just changed so much. So we're, we're super spoiled now because we have, you know, a plethora of yeah. great Mexican restaurants. About five or six, I feel like. Oh my God. Oh, it's, I think it's even more. We were, I, I had Mexican last night. <laughs> 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 and, so, and uh it, 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 it ran into one of my council members and it was like all right and we both love this place but we're not here to do commercials so i'm not going to mention the restaurants oh, all. we mentioned we, can, we, we give can. shout outs right. yeah we totally give shout outs tony caitlin at las riveras that's where okay. we go so all right and uh and so uh, uh but how it's evolved over the last few years here it's in 30 years we have gone from nothing to we got we got decent mexican food here now facts my place is Cozumel's. Yep. Yeah, that joint. They, they've they won me over now. I want to give a shout out to the old school Durango's. Durango's was the place forever. And you know what I liked about them? Food was always the same every time we went in there. It was super affordable and it was fast. Yeah. Like Durango's was just solid. Yeah. So I miss them. Yep. Okay. Wait, what's the favorite Mexican dish? What do we do? See, I, I I love so many different kinds. I'm the I'm the only one in my family that I throw them off when I go because I'll pick something different. But if you really had to push me, you know, tamales. I just love tamales. Uh, but I get I get a different mix there. It's like, okay, what does Mark want today? Because I will not pick the same thing. So I, I <laughs> You're love, that dude. I'm that dude. But it is just kind of fun. Because, but they know I'll have my Diet Mountain Dew. So it's either I'm having a margarita or a Diet Mountain Dew. Okay. Just, just so the residents of Oshkosh know, when it's at lunchtime, it's always a Diet Mountain Dew. Uh, but, you know, on a Friday, a long day, I had that margarita last night. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> All right. Cocktail or beer? Cocktail or beer. It is so, uh, uh, your beer, well, as you age, your favorite beer becomes Michelob Ultra, the low carbs, all that stuff. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. You're wrong uh, for that uh, one. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but I've always liked Killian's Irish Red. That's a Coors product. I, you know, for years didn't realize that. But I liked, I, I liked red ales before IPAs were popular. Okay. Um, so, but, you know, nowadays it's like, oh yeah. And and it's, it's sort of a little joke with friends. It's like, you know, and you've. I, I got together with an old roommate of mine from college from 40 years ago, and we both ordered Michelob Ultras, and we looked at each other like, yeah, that's what our doctors tell us we got to drink now. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> it's, it's, hey, I've learned to like it, and, but, you know, but yeah, but, you know, good old George Killian's red is still, you know, I still love them. So, but I just have to use those a little more, have those a little more. Less frequently. Less frequently. And then I gave up the margarita thing. You know, I, I, I've already told you that one, but uh, I've I've become a Wisconsinite timber and brandy old fashioned. I was waiting. I was waiting for you to say the old fashioned. But literally, I, I swear to I swear to you, maybe just in the last five years, yeah. It was just, somebody just like, well, you got to try it. You, you know, you're in Wisconsin. I was like. Well, these aren't too bad. So, so I've been doing brandy old fashions a lot more. So, uh, just out the other night, we were, I, I was at a meeting. I told you I was at a meeting up in, uh, it was up in Wausau and this place had a special of smoked bourbon old fashioned. I was like, I got to try that. So that was pretty darn good. But, yeah. uh, but brandy old fashions, I just, I've just come to like them. And so I guess I, I have my Wisconsin card now for sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, we got we got to invite you to the fish fry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been doing the fish fry for a long time. <laughs> Shop local. Shop local. Boy, that's going to give up way too much. Shop local. I think of Caramel Crisp. Okay. Going to get a cookie, Shonda, lover. You know, it's 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 downtown, so that's that, you know, as a city manager, it's perfect. You go downtown to these places. But Caramel Crisp is, you know, 90 years strong and uh they, you know, they do have the world's best cookies. I'm not just doing it. I'm not, I believe that that's just not, a, that, that's not their tagline. All right. No, that, look, th here's the thing. This is what the cash is supposed to do. We want to talk about these things and drop these nuggets and people do. Caramel Crisp has come up numerous times. I haven't gone there a lot, but I do remember I've gone there for when I was at UWO, definitely gone there for some lunches and their soup was always amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Soup sandwich deal. That was like fire. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yep, you got it. Concert. Concert. Boy, are you just asking me over lifetime or just like... It's a word association, All right. so you get to take it wherever you want to go. This is going to sound weird. It's a concert I didn't even attend. Journey 1979, Cleveland Municipal Stadium. I was a working kid. 
And this play, this downtown parking garage did not want to have those kids using their parking garage. And so they did maintenance. And I worked for a company that made chemicals for the construction industry. And we did what was called a floor coat job. We basically sealed the concrete in this garage. They didn't want the kids there, so they sealed it on the Saturday of the Journey concert. I got to listen to the entire Journey concert, and I got paid for it. $2.35 an hour, Timber. To, to, <laughs> and, and actually, you know, they didn't really do a real good job of uh, ventilating. The old masks weren't the greatest. So that stuff gave you kind of a headache. But it was it started with a buzz and then it became a headache. Right. Um, so we were just like, we got a little buzz going and we're watching and we're listening to Journey and we're getting paid for it. We thought it was the greatest thing in the world. So I got to listen to an entire Journey concert. Never saw him, didn't pay a dime. Nice. Hey, look, <laughs> bro. Now, what I'm going to say, here's what's funny. I... I just did an episode, not that within the last week or two, and someone brought up Journey again. Yeah. And wait, but they want to see them now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not even saying they're my favorite band or anything. But that's just what you thought of, right? Yeah. It was just, oh, yeah. If you talk about concert, I'll tell you, it's like, well, but you didn't attend it. No, but I heard the whole thing. I mean, it was literally next door to this Cleveland Municipal Stadium. Oh, <laughs> love it. Streaming. Streaming. Boy, I, I, Netflix. I'm just, I, I'm not that, I'm not that advanced. I'm an old guy. It's like my kids have, you know, I had my knee scoped and I had to miss about two weeks of work. And so that was when I got my, my Netflix account. And I didn't, I was like, I didn't want to watch soap operas or Did talk you binge shows out? Day. I binged out. I, th the funny thing is I had never seen an episode of Parks and Rec. I think I was just too busy with work stuff and family stuff. When it was on the air, I never watched Parks and Rec. I had no reason other than just, I just didn't watch it. So I started watching Parks and Rec and I just became a junkie. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> of, you know, and so, you know, of course, you know, nope. Rob, Lowe, Rob, well, and Rob Lowe is a city manager. I mean, come on, look at me. Uh, you know, Rob Lowe. Yeah, you're you know, right there. You're right there. Well, we know that if they do a Parks and Rec about the cash, we're going to get Rob Lowe. We're yeah, fill Rob Lowe. And they'll, they'll have a hard time telling the difference, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. You don't have to comment. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, you know what? I'm going to skip that and we're going to go. Community. Community. I I just think of uh, our senior center. That is a place, even though it's just for older people, there is such a sense of community. I'm probably doing a commercial, but you said word association. That place welcomes everybody, of course, just of an older age. But there are a lot of people who, who come to town as a, an older person, don't know anybody, and they got a place. And they're welcome there. And it's like, yeah, you're a new older person, but you're welcome in. They, they have such a sense of community. And uh, I uh, now now that I'm, you know, in, I'm eligible to be a member, but I, I try to avoid that. But I, I try to avoid that yet. But I know when I go there as a member, I will be welcome with open arms. Oh, so. absolutely. And they have amazing volunteers. Oh, my gosh. We wouldn't, business-wise, the, the the senior center could not function without those volunteers. Well, you got a great staff and everything yes. to be sure. But I mean, and they, they make a point, the staff makes a point of look at all the hours of volunteers we have, right? Whether they're teaching something with computers. I mean, we did a, we do a great job. If you need to know how to, how to use technology, we can train you on that. Or if you want to learn, you know, a, a new hobby in retirement, wood crafting and stuff like that. We got that. We got so many different things. That you can either take something that you always wanted to do, but never wanted, never could do it, or you want to learn something like technology or something like that. But lots of cool things. I volunteer. It's been a while, but I, I volunteered there a couple of times. Let me tell you, those are some of the most vicious games of cards I think I've seen. <laughs> no, <laughs> there. I shouldn't call them vicious. I'll just call them hyper serious. Yeah, like they're, they're, they're serious. Yeah, you get they still get their minds are still sharp and they're they're oh facts yeah and competitive. <laughs> Last word, diversity. You know, eighth grade is my so you're gonna get a story out of this. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting because probably the most diverse situation I was ever in, and if anything, 
I've moved away from it because of where the arc of my life and career went. You know, this is not the most diverse community. You know that. I mean, that's just a fact. Fact. Growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, 1966, you know, first grade, it was the height of baby boomers. My class was packed. There were over 30 kids in my first grade class and mostly white. By the time eighth grade happened, we were 50-50, black and white. So half of what it was, because that was the white flight from the big cities. The year I was born, Cleveland, Ohio, had nearly 1 million people, never hit a million, 960,000 urban study major. That's how I know this stuff, Timber. Cleveland has about 350,000 people now. So people fled. But when I graduated from eighth grade in 1974, there were 15 of us. It was the most, it was a a incredibly diverse group. There was only, you know, my, my teacher was just, she wanted to make sure we, we worked together. And, and as a, she saw my leadership skills and it's like, you got to bring these people together. That she put that on me. She wanted to make sure. And so, you know, we had to play together. We had to, we had to, she had to dance for us. And so all but one of the girls in my eighth grade class, they were all African-American. I learned to dance with African-American girls today. It's like, how, how are you, we're still struggling with that. <laughs> But in 1974, I was doing it. And so it's so funny that I see stuff, but diversity in me takes me back to eighth grade and we work together and, you know, I've lost track with mostly everybody. I ran into one of my eighth grade friends, came to my sister's funeral a couple of years ago and it was, you know, it's just nice to catch up. And then one of the gals, it was, but the last time was, you know, I was working summer jobs in college and I saw each other, but but I can still probably remember all but one or two of the names. I probably remember the first name, maybe not the last name. They, you know, they formed me. And so I was influenced a great deal by that. But that was that was more diverse than we are here in Oshkosh today. And that's not a condemnation of Oshkosh. It's just more of, it's a fact. And, uh, and uh, you know, getting the old middle school dance, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you, you don't want to dance with anybody. But it was like, no, you're going to dance and you're going to dance with the girls in your class. And it was like, well, they were, you know, it was, it was Rhonda and Dewana and Paulette. And it was, they were my classmates. They were my friends. And, uh, and I'll never forget them. I love that. Well, what I will say is, uh, Oshkosh, we are transforming quickly. Yeah demographically. Oh yeah. You take a look at the schools, the school population demographics are much different than our overall community. We can see the future right in schools. It's what I always say too. It is you, if you don't think all you got to do is look at our schools. Yep. They'll tell you everything on who we are going to become in a very short amount of time and make no mistake about who that is. And we, and we, we've talked about this for years. How do you keep kids in town? And how do you keep kids in town? But you make them feel welcome. You make them feel that they, they want to stay and have a future here in the community. And it doesn't matter if it's your kids or my kids or somebody else's kids. We want them to stay because that's our, our future. And I, well, I kind of use this. It's our word. talent pool. It's our talent pool. And a buddy of mine did this out in California. And he was Hispanic and said, you know, I got one question for you. And he told this to a group of professionals. Who's buying your house? When you want to go, and back then it was like retiring, you go up to Idaho or something. That was where Californians, that's where you went and retired. Who's buying your house? So then he went through the demographics. Here's the demographics of buying your house. That's who your future is. You need to do everything possible so that person can afford to buy your house so you can go. So he made it an economic, you know, he gave people an economic reason to want to, you know, celebrate diversity and encourage, you know, entire communities to grow because without the entire community growing you're losing a a buying base for your house well more than that you're losing um there's so many things that you're losing Uh, the economical argument alone is so huge right you lose amazing employers because at the end of the day an employer wants talent and they also want to be able to relate to whoever their constituents are or whoever their customers are right so and that's everyone. 
you know, we are, we are global commerce and no matter how people look at it. And so uh, employers want to make sure that, that their workforce is reflective of the people who buy their products or utilize their services. And that means like they're going to hire diversely. Yeah. And so, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a favoritism thing or, or as people want to constantly have these, these, these challenges about why it's happening. Simply put, there's a, there's a humongous effective and honest business argument about it. Yeah. So even if you don't agree on the, the moral or you know, social reasons, like, well, then let's get it down to basics where you, where you have a vested interest, you, you have an economic interest in diversity. And, you know, if you don't, you're, you're going to hurt yourself. So it's, it is, it is in your best interest to do that. And, uh, I, I got a, a, you know, another great story, you know, cause there's statistics about how diverse workforces work better and are more effective. And, and I have my, I have my trivia contest theory on this. I dragged two of my older boys when they were teenagers. So they're 15, 16, something like that. Um, dragging it to my conference and we had a trivia contest. And so they were at my table and we had a couple interns that, and I was like, Hey, come on over here. They were the closest young kids. So I had college kids, high school kids, me, and a, a guy even older than me. We kicked butt facts because these trivia questions, if I brought all of my city manager peers, all the same guys, we would have gotten, you know, we would have gotten questions about journey <laughs> right <laughs> Music, but when they're talking and then my one of my kids was just i i, I kind of joke with him he was like remember uh uh what was that tv show uh with fun with flags it was a uh, oh gosh what was the name of the show i can't remember it but uh there was a, sh the, a part of the guy did a podcast called fun with flags okay. and it was real geeky my son loves flags so they put a thing up what flag is it he goes that's bangladesh and everybody else like, what are you talking about? Oh yeah, it's a Bangladesh flag. And we got, we got, we crushed the competition because if we had the exact same people, I could take the smartest kids in your class, your graduating class, smartest kids in my graduating class. And we, if we kept together, if, if you did your team and I did my team, we'd both do middling, but we swap players and we have a mixture. We're going to kick butt. Facts. And it's, that's my, so there's my trivia contest theory of diversity. You can take that wherever you want. Oh, no, no, no. And actually I've won, I, due to the fact that I am a UW, former UWO trivia champion. Oh boy. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, do I'm your talk applause. To, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> to my, to my team in the past from the Veterans Resource Center. Okay. Cool. Um, next segment. Kosh Hidden Gems. This is your opportunity to tell about a hidden gem. It doesn't have to be something we all know about. It could be something none of us know about, or maybe something we all know about and we don't know a detail about it. What do you have? Hmm. Wow. Well, wait, when you talk about that, I, I think we don't appreciate, you know, our natural, you know, resource and everything. I would say like the Menominee Park Beach, you know, people don't know about it. West of 41, people just go, oh, you know, I know there's a lake over there, but that's for boating. It's like, no, it's more for, it's more than just boating. You may have a boat. You may be able to afford a boat on the West side, but on the East side, there are some great features and you can, you know, you, you can, uh, you know, you can enjoy a beach. You can enjoy Menominee park. People know about it, but they don't necessarily do anything with it. That's an incredible park. And I get people from out of town and show them that they go, oh my gosh, I had no idea. So I, that's, there's, there's my little hidden gem, Menominee Park Beach. You know, we get Menominee Park often, and, and I'm going to say that is Bosco, the podcast dog's favorite trail to work. We, we walk that whole little circle by the courts and around the zoo and whatnot. And yes, no ifs, ands, or buts, Menominee Park is just fantastic. Like, yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah. So I love that as a hidden gem. It has, no one's brought it up in a while. Uh, okay, we are going to take a quick commercial break. All right. Did you know there are children in the Fox Valley in need of hearing aids, but their parents struggle to provide them because of lack of insurance or high copays? 
I am Juliette Sturkins, audiologist and board member of Here in the Fox Cities, and proud that this small local nonprofit organization has helped fund hearing aids for some 30 kids. Your donation would help more children hear. Visit hereinthefoxcities.org to learn more and to see their smiles. Every child deserves to hear. All right. That is, once again, I'd like to let our nonprofits in the regions know that if you would like a commercial here on the Kosh, I give away commercials free for nonprofits. So please feel free to reach out to us and let us know at askthekosh at gmail.com. And once again, I just want to take a moment and say that this episode is sponsored by Sturgeon Spirits Craft Distillery, the Kosh's newest tradition. A uh, big, big shout out to that team over there at Sturgeon Spirits. We appreciate them. Those libations are yummy. Have you gone there yet? Not yet, but yo, you're getting me in the mood though. <laughs> hey, you need to go on and check them out. Like they're, they're serious. In a, and if you don't know what you want, first of all, what I love is the setting because it, it feels laboratory-ish. Uh, it, it, there's something about it, right? Yeah. There's no TVs in there either. So it's a vibe and like, it's real subtle and it's soothing. And if you don't know what you want, they've got true mixologists there who will make something crafty and yummy for you. Uh, I have created something. We are working on the Kosh cocktail. Oh boy. Hey, Hey, we need these things. There you go. And these test these taste buds are are mature and refined. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mark, our next segment is called Story Time. This is an opportunity for our guests to just tell us a story. Any story you want about anything of your choosing. Well, let's see. Is this where you, uh, we talked about my little my Cleveland connections and stuff like that we you can, know, we can uh, wherever you want to take us well it's super bowl week so you got to get a story oh uh, i love this yeah yes. the super bowl story i could i can give you the scoop um when i was you know my grade school i told you a little bit about that my sister was in eighth grade when i was in first grade and they just my oldest sister i was the only boy so she was like imagine 13 year old girls they they got that mother instinct they really want to take care of you my sister drove me crazy in the first grade because she was constantly watching me mark do this you can't do that and you know she was babysitting me while I was out in the playground trying to just have fun with my friends. And she had a group of friends with her as well. And there was a a gal by the name, and many of them are still friends today. And uh, one of them uh, goes by the name of uh, Judy Kels. Now, a few years ago, I was reading Sports Illustrated and saw Travis Kelsey's name. And my sister said, well, that's Judy's nephew. So, and I've, I'd known the Kels family for years. So number one, it's Kels, not Kelsey. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, it is. And there have been a couple of little outtakes of that. It's slowly out there, but it's Kels. And I've been friends with that family for 60 years. They've known me since I was a baby. And Judy was one of my sister's best friends. And uh, last time I saw Judy, I was back in Cleveland visiting my sister and we went out to breakfast. That was the last time I saw Judy, but I knew about, <clears throat> I knew about Taylor and Travis long before the media did, because my sister was like, guess what? Guess what? You know, oh, so Tra- you had Tra- the lowdown. I had the lowdown. So when people are like, well, this ain't true. It's like, oh yeah, it's true. I do not know Travis Kels. I, I barely, barely remember his dad because he was much older. So I, I don't know Mama Kells. I don't know the kids. I just know his aunt. But it's uh, it's that long connection. But the big story is it's Kells. So I it go and it goes back to first grade because Judy was one of those who was with my sister and you know they'd be ratting me out. I'd be doing something, having fun. And my Bruh. sister just <laughs> hey, hey Mark's doing this. Hey you can't do that. But I remember going to Travis's grandma's house. Because I'd go on the way home, and Mrs. Kels would give me those. Remember those boxed oatmeal raisin cookies? Oh I just, yeah, that is my memory of the Kelses going to their house, and and Mrs. Kels give me these oatmeal raisin cookies. So, uh, it, but there's there's a Super Bowl story for this week, but it's Kels, not Kelsey. No, oh, I love this. 
All right, let's get it. Let's get the record corrected <laughs> <laughs> right here. Oh my gosh! Right of all places uh, that we, uh, we are correcting things nationally here in the Kosh. Yeah. I, I love this. Okay, fantastic. All right. Well, Mark, you may not know, but Kosh listeners know it's that time. Every single time, it makes me happy. And this is no different. All right. So it is time for the topic of the week. This is the topic of the week is chosen by our guest 99.9% of the time. And this week is no different. So, Mark, what's our topic of the week? It's about special assessments, which is somewhat of a boring topic for many people, but it's very important for our community and getting the word out about it. And we've had some listening sessions about it, but special assessments are charges that we put on property owners when we do road improvements in front of their house. And the city picks up a third of the cost and each side of the street picks up another third. But the costs have gone up so much. And in some of the older areas of town, really not too far from right here. If have we done Otter, did you get? Uh, no. I just, my sidewalks CP. were done a while ago. Uh, CP was definitely, uh, Rosalia was just done. Good examples. Rosalia, CP were done. And even in these older areas where the lots aren't too big, the road construction cost was your third share was, and it could be seven to $10,000. I was going to say about 10 or so. So a one-time hit on your, uh, on it, we send you a one-time bill and you can choose to pay it out over on your tax bill over 10 or 15 years, but still 10 grand for people who have very modest houses is a pretty heavy impact. So there, there's a huge equity issue and just, you know, just a cost issue. So council has been struggling with this. And I think there's a general agreement that we want to get rid of special assessments, but where do you, what's the new source of funding? And so the council has wrestled with this. They've they've come on the cusp of changing it a number of times and just didn't do it. The latest solution that they've kind of come up with, and we work very closely with them, we gave them literally like 12 options, and they didn't pick either of them. They took a look at all the different options and kind of patchwork together what is being proposed, and that's to replace it with partially a $35 vehicle registration fee that'll get tacked down to the vehicle registration you pay uh, when you get your license renewed. And then the other part is to charge each of the utilities a portion of their share. Cause when we dig up the street for a new road, we typically replace the water mains and the sewer mains. You don't get charged for that because you already paid that into your utility fee, but adding on a little extra and having the utility pay for that, a, a portion of it, is what we thought would be a good way to do it. And there are imperfections with all of these ideas. There's there's no perfect solution. Some people say, well, why don't you just put it on your property taxes? Well, number one, that'll increase your property taxes. Number two, this isn't a judgment statement. It's a fact. We have a lot of non-taxable property in Oshkosh, more so than other communities. Every community's got churches and schools that are tax exempt. We all know that, but because of the university and the prison and the Wisconsin Resource Center, the Winnebago Mental Health Institution, we've got a lot of tax-exempt properties that if we just put on the property tax roll, when we do those streets, they're not going to pay for that, and you will pay it. And I believe the state, you know, er, statewide, they should be helping us pay for the university share and all those things. So that's been a real struggle. And because there's imperfections with all of them, somebody can come up and say, well, I don't like it for this reason. And all I can say to that person is, yeah, you're right. That's an imperfection with it. I was not a fan of the vehicle registration fee. And when we were talking about it on its own, it would be terrible because the way the law was written, eight vehicles, 8,000 pounds or greater are exempt. Well, they're the, those are the vehicles that cause the most damage. So while I don't like it because it's getting mixed with some other solutions, it lessens the negative aspects of that. But if you have multiple vehicles, you're paying 35 a vehicle. And that will vary. I I guarantee you that will vary with uh, your family situation because you'll have one or two cars, maybe if you've got a family. And then if you start having teenage kids, you might 
add a vehicle. Absolutely. And when, and when, the, when you're empty nesters, you go back to one or two vehicles. Is this including motorcycles and scooters also? Motorcycles and scooters are exempt. There's things called auto cycles, which are kind of three wheeled. Those are included if you have a collector plate because you, and usually people don't drive those that much. They're exempt. Disabled military type of ones, they're exempt, but it's the size of the vehicle. That's really the, the biggest exemption. The bigger vehicles, that exemption is an inequity in my opinion, but because we're just using it for a portion of it and using the utilities that kind of offsets it. So businesses that a you know, small business may not have many vehicles. Some business may have nothing but huge vehicles. Well, they'd pay nothing. So having that utility part of it, the businesses, because of our stormwater fee, they pay a little bit more than you or I pay for a uh, stormwater fee because, you know, we just have our driveway and our sidewalk, you know, not much in our roof, but the businesses have big parking lots, so they'll pay a little more. So it's a way to kind of spread the, spread the hurt, spread the cost around as best we can. So getting people to understand that has been a challenge. And then the other problem is, you know, you mentioned CP and stuff like that. So we haven't done your street. So, but people who have recently had their street done and we're, and we're sending out bills for assessments, those aren't going to go away. Nope. We got to cut it off at a certain point. And I totally understand that be, creates winners and losers, but over time, and it shows the inequity because it's like, so you get hit with it, this big hit. And then it's like, well, that's, that's your cost of paying. It's like, yeah, but if we can spread this cost amongst everybody, when it comes due, then nobody gets special assessed, but there are biz. I, I got a business that's complaining and they have every right to complain. It's like a hundred thousand dollar assessment from a couple of years ago and they're paying it. And I, I recognize that there's imperfections in every plan, but uh, cities have done this recently and they've done the same thing that we're proposing. Appleton, Green Bay have both done this in the last 10 years and they're still struggling with getting enough money to raise for those things. I know Appleton hasn't, uh, they lowballed the number and now they're like, well, we don't have enough money to, to cover these special assessments. Now, what are we going to do? So they're struggling with looking for a solution. So we're all struggling with that, but I think it's people need to know about it. And before we, you know, send you a little notice that we're going to be doing your street and it's going to cost you 10 grand, do we want to find a better solution? And I think council wants to do it and we've had turnover in council. That's a natural turnover. Reeducating everybody every year is, is a challenge, but after a while they come back and they go, the residents want this change, Mark, we got to do something. So it's like, all right, we agree on that. What are we changing it to? And that's where. I will give you every option in the world, right? But, but they, ultimately, they have to make the call. They they have to make the they call. Gotta, they got to do it. That's and, their job. And just you know, just so you know, for you know, understand the role of a council member. Council members get like fifty five hundred dollars a year. That's an awful little bit of money to put up with a lot of people complaining. So you know, understand that <laughs> your council members are true public servants. Facts. They really are. Yeah, yeah, they got to hear a lot of things. Yeah, they but should. it's good. It's good, you know, yeah. because then we it's it's the way local government's supposed to work. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's fair, and I like the idea of this assessment. I do think it's it's one of those things like we we need to find other ways to fund these public streets, you know, because they're utilized by everybody to be able to get those because those assessments when they hit, I know people and they got just. Clobbered, clobbered, you know, and when you get ten, twelve thousand dollars because you got a big chunk, maybe you've got a corner lot, just all of the possibilities of things that could happen. That's tough. It's a, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough chunk of loot. Yeah, and you know, I I live on the west side, and once, and I the term I use is once you hop forty one, they're not modest little forty or sixty foot wide lots. They're 80 and 100 and 120 foot wide lots. So before we, you know, come to a neighborhood near you, think about the impact is going to be on you. And we, we talk about affordable housing all over the place here. And, you know, we're, that is a, it's a legitimate challenge. But meanwhile, people say one of the reasons we're one of the best places to live in the country 
is because of the affordability of housing. So it is kind of a it's it's a weird dichotomy that we're dealing with here. Oh yeah, it's a it's a flex. I mean, it, it's fair. I talk about it all the time that there's this we have this amazing balance of quality for life for cost of living. We get a high quality of life for what I call a fair affordable cost of living. And I moved 32 years ago and I have no regrets for that very reason. But if we want to make housing affordable, throwing a it, it, people don't necessarily know all these things. So they buy a house, they go, oh, they're doing the street next year. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we're doing the street next year. We haven't sent out the notices yet, but once we send out the notice and the greeting, the first greeting card you get from the city is an estimated $10,000 charge. We've just, you know, these people, and if they barely qualified right. the, for the mortgage, right. how are they going to add you know, a $10,000 assessment over 10 years, a thousand dollars more a year. Right. And it's like, and their tax bill, it's going to increase their tax bill like by 50%. So it's about affordability as well. And it's trying to figure out a way we're going to pay the same amount. It's just that we spread it out over a much wider area, spread the hurt. Yeah. And it's, it's just a, we got to do something, and uh, I think it's more than just affordability, though. I mean, it's also like we always have to consider whether people like it or not. It's about the draw to a community. We want to be a draw, a community that draws different individuals, talent, private sector, all of those things, and all of these things go into that formula of what makes us a draw. Because if people don't think that that's competitive, all you got to do is look at all our neighbors. You look at your Amros and your Winniconies and Nina Menasha Fox Crossings and all of that. This is one of those things that you know if we're the if we're the ones standing out there saying, okay, you own a home, and if if whatever the needs are for the street assessment, and boom, you got ten ten twelve thousand dollars hit. You'd be surprised at how people make their choices about where they're going to live. That's a that's a tax base. That could be a tax base decision. Yeah, and we've got to make sure that we don't put in um, barriers for people to want to live here. And that's and what exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. We got to create reasons why to, not why not. Right, and uh, you know one of the things that I typically talk about when we talk about, you know, economic development and quality of life and things like that, you know, people expect us to have good sewers and good streets. Those are minimums. Those are, those are expected. But if you're getting recruited by, you know, a company in town and you go back to your, you know, your uh, significant other and say, Hey, I just visited Oshkosh. You're not going back and telling your spouse or significant other, Oh my gosh, Oshkosh has the greatest sewers in the world. You go back and say, they've got these incredible parks, libraries, schools, you know, museums. And we have to take those things that could become a problem, like special assessments. If that's the focus, mm -hmm. they ain't coming. Facts. And we got to, we got to make the, the discussion about all of these great amenities so that we're not focusing on these other things that just become a distraction and a, a reason to say no to wanting to come here. Facts. Big facts. Okay. Mark, is there anything else you would like to say on this subject before we start winding now? I would just, 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 uh, we've got some, uh, listening sessions that we had where some people gave some great questions. We probably got four hours of programming. So just to listen to some of it, we've yes. got our presentations. I'm going to give you the link to this so that you can share it with your, with your listeners and everything so that people can just take a look and, you know, form your own opinion. There is not a perfect answer. So, and you may learn something, you know, did you think about this? We've thought about a lot of stuff, but every session I get a question that I didn't think of. So <laughs> So, but that's part of the, if you aren't right. listening, you aren't going to get them. So I, I enjoy that. And then I add it to our frequently asked questions. So I got a, a series of frequently asked questions that are better than they were last week. And next week, they're going to be better than they are today. And we're going to keep pumping those out so people can draw some conclusions and then let your council member know they, they want to hear from you. They're struggling with this uh, as much as anybody else. So yeah, just, you know. 
be on the lookout for those things. Facts. All right, Mark. Thank you. We're going to start winding up this episode. All right, Kosh listeners. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for giving us your minds and ears. Thank you for caring about our community and listening to this conversation. This was fire. This was so good. Um, If you care about the Kosh, this here you get to learn about the kosh and i think that goes a long long way um as you know we are a work in progress we are always trying to get better uh but we can't get better without you so how do we do that hey please feel free to reach out to us and tell us how we can become a better podcast um also if you would like to be a guest or if you would like to recommend a guest reach out to us at askthekosh at gmail.com once again that is askthekosh at gmail.com and then kosh listeners i have a request for you help us be the best we can be and how can you do that we are a work in progress we want to get in front of the most eyes and ears that we can in this community regionally and in the kosh how do you do that it's analytics Analytics spreads the word about this, I'm going to just say an amazing podcast. And how do you increase analytics? Since you're listening to the cash right now, take a moment and hit the subscribe button. And then if you've got a few more seconds, leave us a quick review. Good, bad, or indifferent. Just tell us what you think. And hopefully you value this podcast as, as much as um, people who do listen currently and our future listeners who are going to fall in love with us here at the Kosh. That's what I'm going to say. All right, then. Now, it is that time. It is shout-out time. All right, Mark, who you got for shout-outs? Wow. Uh, We've got so many different community groups that do wonderful things. You know, uh, uh, I'm going to be getting a new neighbor over at City Hall, and it's going to be the Christine Ann Center. Mm. Um. They are moving into the what's the former beach building, and uh, they're moving. They're just moving over one house, but they're going to be next door. Be able to improve their ability to serve the community, and uh, we actually uh, the city gave them some funds from our American Rescue Plan Act, also known as ARPA. Oh, we should have talked about that. We're still soliciting. I'm going to send you that link too. So we were soliciting proposals from other nonprofit groups. And so there was my reason to, I just wanted to slip that one in there. But Christine Ann, you know, they, Domestic Abuse Center, they, the services they provide, it's not just about a shelter for, for families that are victims of domestic abuse, but it's the services they provide. They, they try to prevent domestic abuse, as well as treat and assist people after uh, they want to improve their lives. That's going to be our next door neighbor at City Hall, and I'm looking forward to it. I think it's a a wonderful organization. They do so much for the community, and uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good thing. Oh, facts. And you know what? We do have an episode with that executive director. So if you want to learn more about Christine Ann Center, check out that episode of The Kosh. Cool. All right. Any other shout outs? No, I just wanted, you know, that we are taking applications for American Rescue Plan Act. We have to commit the funds by the end of 2024. We don't have to spend them till the end of 26, but we have to say we're going to give it to XYZ organization and stuff. So we're soliciting applications right now. And what kind of organizations are you looking for? I mean, generally nonprofits, but uh, groups that have been impacted by COVID is our primary impact. And impacting means the demands for their services have increased. And I think, you know, we were talking earlier that some of this has been a delayed effect. And so council purposely held back allocating funds because they knew that it wasn't just the immediate impact. It was the lasting and the, the hidden impacts of COVID. So to the degree organizations recognize that things have gotten a little tougher for people and it's just now starting to uh, see itself We want that out there. So we're accepting applications. The next round is technically going to be March 1st. I'll see how the applications go. We've got still about 2.3 million in funds that the council wanted to allocate to nonprofit, non-infrastructure type of things. So uh, we want to see what's out there and uh, try to help these groups. But we've done, we've helped Christine Ann, Kids Foundation with Tiny Homes, Food Co-op, 
and a couple others, I just can't remember, Advocat, because they did a lot with uh, helping people uh, meet you know, rent assistance and mortgage assistance. So, and I, and the Boys and Girls Club, those are, those are groups that we helped out, but we can do more. Most of the first round was just capital, most of it, but not all. So we want to know what impacts are out there and we want to try to help people. Okay. Love it. All right. My shout outs this week are a, hey, want to send a special shout out to the Kosh listeners as I continue to be, you know, bounce between communities and get the opportunity. I get the flow in and out of uh, everywhere from GB to Fondy. And, um, you know, people stop me all the time and I just have these amazing conversations. And I never know where these listeners are coming from, but it is amazing the reach. So to the Kosh listeners, I see you. I hear you. I appreciate you. Uh, I want to send a special shout out to my man, Jesus Smith, over there at Lawrence. Uh, we, me, him, and a uh, shout out to People of Progression are going to, are hosting a Black Professionals networking event uh, that's coming up here. And hopefully this episode gets out before this. In February 15th, we're calling it Third Thursday. So every third Thursday of the month, Commodore Club located in Appleton, Black Professionals, please join us. Let's get to know each other. Uh, the one thing about this region is we actually don't even realize the amount of talent that we have between all sorts of professions, entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, engineers, and everything else in the sun exists. And the sad part is often we don't even know each other. So we're going to work on that. And we're going to change that. And uh, this is very intentional on that. And then my last shout out is to anyone out there in the Northeast region who is facilitating a Black History Month program. Thank you for doing that. Uh, these need to happen. It is essential uh, to our nation uh, that that we do celebrate Black History Month, All right? That is it for shout outs. Now, there is only one thing left to do, Mark, and that is this. You get three choices. Choice one, you can share some parting words of wisdom with the Kosh listeners. Choice two, you can tell us what would yourself today tell 13-year-old Mark? Or choice three, like a true multiple choice test, you can do all of the above. You can do both. So which one, what, what are we tackling? Well, I'll do the 13 year old one because it, you know, you'll get a little more insight. Uh, I would have uh, told the 13 year old Mark, don't waste your time on pre-med. It's not going to work out because <laughs> I, I was pre-med for a first year of college. And then I realized where my passion was, was with, uh, community building and things like that. And, uh, I learned, I learned the hard way, both, uh, realizing that my interests were more towards public service and then also a D in biology did it too. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, if I had not taken that biology class, if I had taken any other class, I probably would have graduated magna cum laude, but I had a lot of, of ground to make up in college after my freshman year. So, uh, so I would, it's a, don't, don't waste your time on pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor to help people. There's so many ways to help people. And there's a lot smarter people than me can be doctors. <laughs> mm, I think that is awesome. All right. What you think, Mark? Had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. When I coming back? Oh, you can definitely come back. <laughs> hey, you know what? This is the cash. Yeah. 